On the godless side, um, the, the attack on Christianity has gone at a different pace and at a slightly different time uh, compared to anything equivalent in Islam. And I've been trying to piece together the time scale for this. And it, st it started, as far as I can tell, around 1850. By the time you got to 1900, the people ruling in Britain at the very top of society had still were, by and large, extremely well educated and thoughtful about matters relating to God, matters relating to the Bible, matters relating to Christianity and the importance of faith. If you look at um, uh, Arthur Balfour, of, of Balfour Declaration fame, he, he was Prime Minister at one point uh, in, the, in the 1900s. Now, when he was at university, the first thing he did is he studied philosophy and he studied until he developed a, a view of what uh, revelation was, of what the Bible was, of what faith was, of what God was, as a framework for his life. That level of diligence, of thought, of reason, no longer exists. If you roll forward to the 1940s in this country, so that's only 50 years, it's not long. Um, we have a wonderful Christian writer called C.S. Lewis making a speech to evangelical churches in Wales and saying, if you're speaking to the masses in Britain, you have to you have to simplify everything because they're so ignorant of Christianity. They no longer know what the words mean. They no longer understand. They've become cold-hearted and ignorant. And that's by the 1940s, and that's in just 50 years. In, 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 in biblical eschatology, this is, this is predicted. And I, I, what I want to ask is whether there's anything equivalent in Islam. In, Islam. In, biblical, in biblical prophecy and eschatology, it says, before Christ returns, there will be a great falling away. There will be an abandonment of truth by most. So the masses of men will walk away from the truth. They'll kill you and think they do God a favour if they believe in God at all. Um, so the, the destruction of Christianity as a large and important factor in our society, not as a truth, not as a, something that's in the hearts of individuals, but as a, as a, as a, a major influence in how the nation as a whole governs itself, conducts itself, thinks about itself and others. That destruction has happened in Christianity some, some time ago. But there's an explanation. So Christians who know their Bible are not surprised. This is the great falling away. So the question I've got for you is twofold. One, do you see an equivalent or similar falling away in Islam, Islamic thought, and I'm aware now that something like 25% of the youth in Islam are rejecting religion, and I don't know if that's the correct number, maybe you can comment on that. And if there is a falling away in Islam, is there an equivalent Islamic tradition and understanding from the Quran that says that this is prophetic, this is something that has to be and will be, and signals the, the, the great, you know, the end times, the great end time uh, uh, events. Yes, I'm afraid I have to confess that there is a spectacular decline in the world of Islam of the capacity to think. And uh, 
I put the blame for that on a modern Western civilization which has taken control of the system of education around the world in which secular education replaces sacred education. An incapacity to think, to think deeply, to be able to connect the dots. And so we have an amazing number of sheep and cattle in the world of Islam today. One of the most dangerous attacks which have been launched to enslave us is the attack in the world of money. And the Quran has warned us about it, our Prophet has warned us about it, and these people are blissfully ignorant and they don't care to learn. And so they are dancing to every tune that the Dajjal plays, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and all, petrodollar and all. And when you try to teach them, they shut the doors on you. This is the contemporary world of Islam. When the Western world went out to conquer the rest of the world at the point of a naked bloodstained sword, and then established the colonial and imperial rule over the rest of mankind, they didn't go there to stay. Churchill perhaps didn't understand that. They went there to transform those societies into carbon copies of themselves. One of the things they did was to take real money out of the market. Real money, money with integrity. They don't even know the meaning of the term money with integrity. And they don't care to learn money with integrity. Even the monetary economist still doesn't care for the term money with integrity. The monetary economist is not okay. They took money with intrinsic value and banned it. You're not allowed to use money with intrinsic value. And they replaced it. Prepare yourself for this, David. They replaced it with money with fictitious value. And then they could control the value of that money as Imran Khan in Pakistan is now learning too late. And when they don't like your profile, they can bring down the value of your money. And as they bring down the value of the, it's very easy for them. You don't like your profile in Venezuela, your Bolivia, your Venezuelan Bolivar will be worth nothing. They don't like your profile in Zimbabwe, your Zimbabwe dollar will be worth nothing. And they don't like your profile in Pakistan, they will bring down the value of your money and prices will rise. This is called inflation. It's the most dangerous weapon of all that they have. How do you deal with it? Answer simple. Even a schoolboy can understand it, but these cannot, the sheep and cattle. The answer is you have to bring back money with intrinsic value. And intrinsic value, this, the dinar is in the Quran, a dinar is a gold coin. The dirham is a silver coin. All that you need is a police in the market to ensure the integrity of the money. So there is no there's no alloy, there's no uh, subverting the value of the money. It's remarkable, Sheikh, because we're now talking about money, inflation, usury, and another of the main reporting focuses that we have at UK Column is the attack on the mind, psychology. Just last week, David recommended to viewers a book entitled The People of the Lie in order to understand psychological attack. And yet you're revealing to us that the monetary basis or the monetary situation we have is also that people of the lie are in charge. I even suggested the other day to somebody that it would sound more sonorous in Arabic if we call it Ahl al kazab The people of the lie are steering our economy. al kazab Kalb is the dog. Kazab is the lie, yeah. 
the, the idea of, of honest money is, is really fundamental. Now, Brian recommended a book. I'm, I'm also going to recommend a book. To the Brian. viewers. To the viewers of this discussion. To the viewers, yeah. Um, and, and, and the book that I'd recommend they read is, is uh, The Mystery of Banking by Murray N. Rothbard. So Murray Rothbard, who is an um, economist, uh, a philosopher, uh, atheist Jewish, married to a, to a Christian lady, right? But he believed in liberty and he had a good mind. And uh, he studied history, he studied economics, and he wrote a great deal. And he wrote about banking. And it's, it's, it's well named as a mystery because when you, when you get to the nitty gritty of how the sleight of hand works, you have to read it three or four times. How did they do that? It's a bizarre system. And the comparison, honest money, uh, is not that long departed from Britain. I'm just about old enough to remember old money. I remember old money being kept in the house because it was silver and had intrinsic value. And you had a tiny little coin, a tiny little coin about this diameter, uh, that was a silver thruppenny bit. And then you had a sixpence, which was exactly twice the weight. And then 12 pence made a shilling, and it was a slightly bigger coin, exactly twice the weight again. And then you had a two shilling coin called a flodden, exactly twice the weight, and then a half crown and a crown, and it was all on weight. So you could take in the day all of your silver money. You didn't need to count it. You could put it in a bag and weigh it and you got the exact amount that it said on the face of the coin. Look at that. So our modern money has truly been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Yeah. And Murray Rothbard's book explores how the banking industry made this into a fraud and how the fraud works. And it is very strange. Many, many bankers don't understand how it works and what their job actually entails. Um, but it is you're absolutely correct in pointing to inflation. One of the main engines of changing society. Now, we were reporting on this just yesterday. We were reporting on the situation in Sri Lanka, where they, they, cannot, uh, they, they cannot afford enough um, imported materials to have a medical system that works. So the, there's, the hospitals are running out of supplies. The money they're paying the doctors is no longer enough for the doctors to live. They can't get fuel, they can't get, a, get fuel for their cars, they can't get food and housing and live a reasonable life despite being doctors and professionally trained and all the rest. And what's destroying the Sri Lankan economy? Well, one huge aspect of it is inflation. The, the prices of everything keeps going up because the currency is being devalued. It's really the value of the money that's going down. The money is going down, that's right. So, and this is being used, and this society is now starting to turn once again, brother against brother, right? Neighbor against neighbor, the supporters of one political party against the supporters of another, and they're harming one another, and they're killing one another, and there's riots, and there's trouble. And what's generating it? What's generating all of the anger, all of the hatred? Well, one of the tools, as you correctly point out, is inflation. I hope that former Prime Minister Imran Khan listens to this interview. The, the target was not just inflation. It's a very dangerous weapon that they have, inflation. But they also use the banking system to lend you more money than you can possibly repay. John Perkins did us a great, great favor in writing Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Okay? And uh, when you have reached that stage where you are now in debt beyond your capacity to ever escape from it, 
you are a slave. How do you respond? Answer, the moral law is the highest law. And in the moral law, there is no room for oppression. And this is oppression. And I believe that even English common law, so for foreign viewers, that's the basic layer of customary law based on the Bible that we have had in the British Isles for a long time, including in Scotland, despite claims to the contrary. Common law has formalized this. There is such a concept, I'm afraid it's a strange Norman French word, promissory estoppel, okay. which is relevant to this. You cannot be held to a promise, to the long and the short of it is, you cannot be held to a promise made under false pretenses. This is also in the Torah, that no debt can last more than seven years. At the end of seven years, the Torah says the debt must be wiped out in order to avoid oppression. So how do we respond to this? Our answer is this is oppression. The moral law has no, uh, uh, does not accept proper, zero tolerance for oppression. And so we announce all the indebted countries of the world. We announce that we are no longer capable of paying the interest on our loans. And so we are engaged now in unilateral repudiation of all interest on loans. But we assume the responsibility, morally so, of repaying the capital sum borrowed. This is based on the doctrine of repudiation of riba. That's right. And uh, we accept that we will repay you the loans that you've given to us, but we'll do so based on our capacity to repay, not on your schedule of repayment. Again, Sheikh, if we take this to the local level, completely secular people in England have faced this. Uh, we have interviewed and drawn attention to the plight of people who signed mortgage agreements, which later proved to have been outright forged. Forged. Others independent of them have testified to UK Column and other media platforms that they were instructed by both local bank branch managers in the chemical application of forged signatories, signatures okay. to mortgage deeds. And again, the, I would say, godly and also English common law response was offered in these cases. I can repay the capital on the loan, but I am not able to afford your exorbitant interest with the dwindling purchasing power of money. And we should add, this is one of the reasons why within society in Britain and certainly within political society, nobody wants to talk about common law. And people who are taking law degrees say that common law is barely mentioned in some of the degrees at, at some of the universities teaching law. It has been pushed to one side. And I think that we can assume that is because the common law provides um, capable remedies for dealing with issues where it is not simply just a criminal action. It's, a, it's an action which is against the word of God, of being truthful, being honest, being caring for people. But I just wanted to add something else, if I may, and that is that many, many people who view your videos and maybe the people who watch this discussion will believe that the British Broadcasting Company, the BBC, is an upstanding and moral organisation. But they may be surprised to know that the BBC worked, uh, this is just one example, but they worked within Kazakhstan to introduce soap operas very low grade afternoon, uh, what do we call them? Televisual entertainment. Entertainment. In Kazakhstan, the BBC introduced this very low grade entertainment where it said in its own literature very clearly that we introduced subjects important to the people like how to use a cash machine, how to use a credit card, so the BBC 
as a media organisation, as a multi-billion pound media organisation, was working inside a very vulnerable society in order to introduce these fraudulent uh, global monetary policies. And this is where all of us need to be very discerning about how this corruption of our society is being promulgated. And I'm, I, I will add some more to this, but the BBC, huge weapon of, of Britain in subverting people's thoughts and views and values. Thank you, um, Brian, for uh, bringing to the table the information about the sinister role of the BBC. Uh, I would like to go back uh, to the Quran to understand what's happening today in Ukraine and in Russia. When the crucifixion was about to take place, Jesus did not know what's going to happen. The Quran has recorded a conversation in which the Lord God spoke to Jesus and said to him, O oh Jesus, I'm going to take your soul. The Quran says that death is like divorce. Divorce is a process that lasts for three months. And at the end of the process, only then does the divorce enter into force. So at the beginning of the process, you're not yet divorced. Death is just like that. Death begins with the soul being taken, but that is not death yet yet. Because when the soul is taken, the Quran says that the Lord God now has a choice. He can either keep the soul, in which case it's death, or he can return the soul, in which case you didn't die. So when he took the soul of Jesus and he said he was not killed, he was not crucified, there's only one logical answer. And that is he took the soul and then returned it when no one was seeing. So it was not death. And then he says, I'm going to raise you unto myself. So Jesus is not in heaven. No, he is with the Lord God. And then he says, I'm going to purify you of all that they're, they have hurled against you. They're hurling against me now. And when I purify you of this, they, they declared, oh, no, I mean, he's a bastard, his mother committed sin and all these things. He's a liar and all these things. When I have purified you, he says, I'm going to raise those who follow you above and dominant over those who rejected you and who are attacking you. And when I do that, these who follow you will remain in that position of dominance until the end of the world. And so Alex, a Christian people would become the dominant force in the world in the end time. And when that Christian people assume that position of dominance, they will remain there until the end of the world. Tell that to Jerusalem for me. <laughs> so now, is it happening today? Yes. From the time the Soviet Union folded its tent and disappeared into the darkness of the night, Russia has been returning to her orthodox Christian heart. They, tempt, they thought they could destroy Russia with a garage sale. 
Brian has described one wing of it through the media. I can testify that British intelligence, US intelligence, was doing the same through another route in the same period. Throw some dirty money and entertainment at them and they will forget God and join us. <laughs> so then something else happened now. The Lord God planned, they planned and he planned. And Russia then suddenly, within a brief period of time, suddenly rose militarily to an extent that they now have hypersonic missiles that nothing in the West can match. There was a, a ship, a Russian ship in the Mediterranean Sea that fired a missile at an ISIS camp in Syria. And there was a, an American aircraft carrier parked in the Gulf, the Persian Gulf. And when they monitored that missile and the speed at which it flew, the American <laughs> missile aircraft carrier <laughs> fled from the Gulf. Brian was saying to me two days ago, that unlike the whole period of the Cold War and the three decades since, we now no longer hear on mainstream media propaganda and the US carrier fleet is cruising towards the scene of the action. No, we don't hear that anymore. <laughs> it's silence. As far as Ukraine is concerned, we don't hear anything of the American Navy and it's because of those missiles. Because of the hypersonic speed. And this is in the Quran. We don't have the time, Aleph to teach the whole Quran in this interview, but this is in the Quran. So the Lord God is on the side of Russia. Tell them to take that and put it in their pipe and smoke it. From the Quran, we know the Lord God is on the side of Russia. And Russia therefore is returning to its Orthodox Christian heart. And guess what the Russians are doing? Did you heard it? You want your oil? Pay for it in rubles. I know that you will get some criticism for having said that, Sheikh, but I will add this. I do a lot of work as a Bible translator for the countries of the former Soviet Union, especially for those which are most pro-Western and which contain the most Protestants, namely Ukraine and Georgia. Ukraine in particular has since 2014, since the last coup d'etat, had a lot of religious people in its national parliament, the Verkhovna Rada, various Baptists, various Catholics, various Pentecostals. None of them has publicly repudiated the lies of those who lead the West. They have all in practice, including Alexander Turchinov, who was acting president after the coup, the Maidan, they have all said we need to ally with the dirty forces of the West and political Israel in order to realize our national dream. So I can understand where you're coming from when you say that God is on Russia's side there. Okay. The moral law is that the means must conform with the end morally. Okay. The end does not justify the means. You cannot use evil means to achieve a moral end. Russian ruble is holding firm. You cannot attack Russia with the weapon of inflation anymore. Okay? They have control of the Russian central bank. Well, Russia, re, re, you blame yourself for that. This is your central bank and they have control of it. That's terrible. So Russia is showing the world that we can turn away from that monetary system from the Antichrist, which is bogus. And we can get our money to be supported by gold. And Russia is now surviving. What has China done? <laughs> are you aware that the articles of agreement of the International Monetary Fund prohibit the use of gold as money. Why? Because if you bring gold in the market as money, your bogus money will collapse. It's as simple as that. So what Russia, what China is doing? When the 
US dollar was in no man's land. When Richard Nixon in 1971 reneged on his obligations under international law to redeem US dollars for gold to any central bank. And when Charles de Gaulle's successor, Charles de Gaulle started it. The same, the same de Gaulle who said he was not joining NATO fully because it was a protection racket. But when Charles de Gaulle was removed because the Zionists didn't want him, because he stood up in the French National Parliament and he denounced the monetary system as unjust and favoring the United States. He had the capacity to see what our Muslims still can't see. We have a lot of sheep and cattle, a lot. So the successors of Charles de Gaulle continued his policy. And by 1971, the game was up because France forced them. So then Richard Nixon reneged on your sacred obligation under international law to redeem the US dollar for gold at $35 an ounce. They couldn't do it because they had printed more paper than they had gold. They should go to jail for that, okay? So when he reneged, from 1971 to 73, the US dollar was in no man's land, but there was no one to attack it. And we then know from Sheikh Yamani's memoirs that it was not an Arab initiative to cause the oil crisis of that year. He was leaned upon by the Bilderberger Group, wasn't he? By Western they, globalists. They, they planned the war of 1973 and they did it brilliantly so that they would be on both sides of the war. <laughs> so you could take the war to a draw. The Soviet Union was behaving in a convenient way. Hmm? And when the war came to us a draw, then Kissinger flew to Riyadh and he secured the greatest victory ever, ever, ever secured by any diplomat in human history. Kissinger did it. When he got Faisal, who at that time, may Allah have mercy in his soul, Faisal didn't have anything more than peanuts in his head. And he got Faisal to agree to sell oil for only US dollars. Yes, and so the petrodollar was born and the US dollar was able to fly higher than ever before. Now look what's happening. But Sheikh, just two or three years after that, Kissinger was off to open up China, having first prepared the ground so that Western globalists could open uh, yeah. concessions while it was still illegal in the USA. The Kissinger must be regretting now, regretting now what he went to do in China because it has backfired on him. The Chinese are now saying to, to Saudi Arabia and planning for the collapse of the petrodollar, in fact, it is going to collapse, that we are prepared, they've been telling this to Saudi Arabia for a few years now. And MBS, the Saudi leader, has now read what so many others have not read. Mohammed bin Salman has recognized, because of his Jewish advisors, that Pax Americana is in irreversible decline. He's not even returning Biden's calls now, apparently. That's right. So Saudi Arabia says, we don't want to remain on this train anymore. <laughs> we know that Israel is going to replace the United States. So they are now prepared to participate in the demolition of the petrodollar monetary system. And China says, well, we already, China says, we'll pay for your oil in Chinese yuan. So goodbye to the petrodollar money system because Saudi Arabia is the world's greatest uh, supplier of oil and China is the greatest buyer of oil. We'll pay for the oil in Chinese yuan. And when we have done that, we are prepared to redeem the yuan for gold. So we are not in violation of the International Monetary Fund. Look at what Russia is doing. 
You want our oil? Pay for it in rubles. And with the infrastructure now being developed in Asia, this oil can be sent to both Russia and China, and Russian gas can be sent west, with no possibility of a naval blockade by the West, That's, because it's yes. over land. That is, that is quite true, but we're talking about the collapse of the monetary system. If the petrodollar monetary system collapses, Alex, there will be civil war in the United States. There'll be anarchy in the United States. The Americans are allowed to buy weapons. You just go to a shop and buy. And they will be so angry in the United States when all their money evaporated. It's gone because the US dollar collapses. You, what can you do to avoid civil war and anarchy in the United States when the United States is the ruling state in Pax Britannica? The military analysts here, Brian, will realize they need a great war. They need a great war to have a cover over the collapse of money. So there is a group, a clique within the modern West, not the whole country, not the whole people, who are moving incrementally towards the Great War, part of the reason for which is to be able to cover the collapse of money. This, this is the Milhama, the prophetic war. I think, David, you were going to raise a point. No, no, only after you, Brian. You, were you going to say something? Uh, no, I was just aware that you were. Well, I, I was I was going to move it on to something a bit different or, or related. Uh, because um, before I started watching your videos, I didn't think there was such a thing as Islamic eschatology. Because I'd never seen anything. And then here was you talking about this thing. So this is interesting. And then watching the videos, I kind of got the view that you were, to use a Christian phrase, a voice crying in the wilderness. Okay. Um, but I want you to talk a little bit, if you would, about, about, your, about your, your views and, and your understanding of Islamic eschatology. And if I could maybe ask you to focus on certain cities, right? In, in, in the Christian... Uh, in, the, in the Christian tradition, in the Christian Bible, you have at the core two cities. Uh, you've got Jerusalem representing the rule of God, however inaccurately the people who actually occupied the city over the years actually conducted themselves because they killed all the prophets. But Jerusalem represents the throne of God, the government of God. And you've got Babylon representing confusion and the opposition to the law and um, uh, the, the, the rule of Satan, ultimately. Right? So you've got these two cities. Now, Babylon moved. Babylon became one empire after another. Right? It became Persia, it became Greece, it became Rome. So the idea of Babylon became transferred to Rome. So you end up having Jerusalem and Rome. Now I understand, and this is largely missing from Jerusalem and Rome. R O M E. Yeah. R O M E. R O M E. A Rome. city in Italy. Uh -huh. A city in Italy. Yes. Go ahead. Right. So, so. So I, this is the accent problem. I'll, I'll think, try harder. No, no, no. I just want to be able to establish you're not talking about Rome of the Quran. You're talking about a city in Italy. Go I'm ahead. I'm talking please. about Rome as in where the Vatican is based in Italy. Right. So you've got Babylon, Rome being the new Babylon. You've got Europe and the West being the center of the new Babylon. You have Jerusalem representing the law and the rule and the sovereignty of God. Now, um, then as biblical eschatology works out, you've got how these cities interact. Now, 
one thing that's largely missing, but you talk about it, but largely missing from the Christian view of these things is reference to Constantinople, the second Rome. Okay, uh, and this is this is an area I'd like you to, to speak about. So, are the cities that you look at that are of significance in end times, Jerusalem and Rome and Constantinople, are these the cities that you focus on? And could you could you explain what your understanding of of the end times is as it relates to these three? Rome, the city in Italy, does not have any major place or role in Islamic eschatology. Rome in Italy is simply a part of the West. Well, yes, it is an important part of the West, the decadent West, and therefore a tool in the hands of the Antichrist. Jerusalem in the end time has only this role, that it would rise to become center stage in the world. And when it does so, the city in which our prophet is buried, which today is called Medina, would be in forlorn desolation. So there is a dramatic picture before us, that when this comes into place, that Jerusalem is high up where it is today, that even Putin just had to offer an apology, okay, for what his foreign minister said. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> Medina, symbolizing the world of Islam, is in a state of forlorn desolation. Our prophet said, this is the sign that the next event to occur would be the Great War. And that is a war in which the Lord God is going to intervene. And he will intervene to ensure that that part of the Christian world, which is still faithful to Jesus, the son of the Virgin Mary, that that part of the Christian world will receive his help and would be victorious. And the other part of the Christian world, which is laden with sin, he'll deal with them. That is in the Quran. That is in the Quran. So we already know the outcome of the great war, which is coming. That modern Western civilization will not play any significant role on the stage of the world after that great war. This is going to be, be a shock to them. Well, this is Islamic eschatology talking. You better listen. And that part of the Christian world, which has now been badly damaged, of course, but still has survived in the Great War, has a gift coming to it. And it is because there will be sufficient Muslims who will survive the Great War for a Muslim army within seven years of that war. A Muslim army to now conquer Constantinople. The conquest of, the, the conquest of Constantinople prophesied by Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, takes place after the Great War not in 1453, or the bogus jihad launched by a sultan, an Ottoman sultan named Muhammad Fatih. Sinfully so, because the Quran has said, if your enemy wants peace, you must reciprocate. You cannot continue fighting when he wants peace. You cannot initiate war when he prefers peace. That is in the Quran. The Ottoman Sultan betrayed the Quran. Brian has been a guest officer of the Royal Navy on board a Turkish ship named after the conqueror. That's the Fatih. Right. Yes. 
Yes. So he, he attacked Constantinople despite the fact that the patriarch wanted peace. That's his first violation of God's law in the Quran. The second one is the Quran orders you to fight if necessary to protect the church and the synagogue and the cathedral and the temple and the masjid. Fight if you have to do so to protect them. And instead of doing that, the Ottoman Sultan, I don't care, to peanuts if you are angry with me. My duty is to proclaim the truth and I'll do that despite all your threats. The Ottoman Sultan betrayed the Quran a second time. The first thing that he did when he conquered Constantinople, sinfully so, is to take Hagia Sophia, which was the greatest Orthodox Christian cathedral for 1,000 years. And then he converted it into a masjid to the eternal shame and disgrace of the world of Islam. And that pain and suffering, they have lived with it, particularly the Greek Christian, but also the Russian Christian, and also the whole of the Orthodox Christian world. They have lived with that pain and that suffering for 600 years. Until with my, I was blessed to penetrate Islamic eschatology. And then I realized what I didn't realize before. And I gave my first lecture on this subject, the conquest of Constantinople in the end time. I did it at the International Islamic University in Malaysia, in the masjid with a few thousand students present and with six Turkish professors sitting right in front of me. I said, when we conquer Constantinople after the Great War, in that prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, that a Muslim army will conquer Constantinople. And he praised the army and he praised the commander. I said, there are two reasons why it is Constantinople which is going to be conquered, not Jerusalem. Number one, a Muslim army must do it because if a Christian power does it, it'll provoke civil war. That's why the Muslim must conquer it, not the Christians. Number two, it'll free the Bosphorus. So a navy located in Crimea, in the Black Sea, can now access the Mediterranean. See, that's bad news for Israel. But most of all, that when we conquer Constantinople, we will return Hagia Sophia to the Christian world. Hagia Sophia will be returned to those to whom it rightfully belongs. And you can do what you want. You cannot stop it. This is Imran speaking. Yes, do what you want. You cannot stop You can kill a man, but you cannot kill the truth. That will bring about the fraternity between the world of Islam and the world of Orthodox Christianity. So history is moving towards Constantinople. That is where the drama is. Once you see that conquest of Constantinople takes place, the Antichrist, you see, mission ready is accomplished now. I can now emerge in human form. I've done everything to take Israel for a ride. I've set them up and they don't know it. They're so blind. So the prophet said that after the conquest of Constantinople, only then will the Antichrist appear in human form. The rest you have to go to my book entitled The Messiah, the Quran and the End Time. And you've also written the book Constantinople and the Quran. Yes, I wrote. Constantinople in the Quran in two weeks. <laughs> Is there a significance to the form of the name found in the Quran, Constantinia, in an Arabized form? This just is this just a matter of language. Constantinople in English, Constantinia in Arabic. Okay, but the reason why the name has changed and banned in in in, in Turkey 
And now you're not allowed to use any other name but Istanbul. It's to try to cover and hide this eschatology. Even though Istanbul is ultimately a Greek name. Whatever it is, but you're hiding the name because I am the one who brought it back on the front table. And my book has been translated to Greek and I'm going to Greece, inshallah, and we're going to launch the book in Greece. I'm hoping that when I get to Armenia, we'll also have the book in Armenian and we'll have it published in time for my visit. Well, I know the translator. He's a colleague of mine. I don't think he'll let you down. David has spoken to a conservative, anti-globalist rabbi in Israel and has put to him the question, correct me if I'm wrong, what would you do if you knew that you were being taken for a ride by Dajjal? This, yeah, I was wondering whether to raise this, but yeah. th thank you for let's raising say, this. David, let's say. Right, so I've, I've got a very good friend who is a very senior, very well-respected rabbi from an Orthodox community in Israel. And, um, and I, it, it's a pleasure to talk to him, right? Now, he's very clever, very clever man, uh, and he can be quite guarded about what he says, but he's also got a wife, right? And she's very clever, but she's not so guarded. So I've learned a lot about Judaism and had a lot of very pleasant conversations. So I asked him a question one day. I said, look, in, in Christian biblical eschatology, the Antichrist does a deal with the Jews. And it's, it's to last seven years and it's to make the Jews number one. Yeah. And after three and a half years, he betrays the Jews and he sets up himself to be worshipped in the temple and then the Jews are then persecuted, like never before. So, now that's a Christian understanding of it. So, but there's A, you, you're probably aware of this viewpoint, but B, there's enough in the prophet Daniel that you get a framework for this. There's going to be a betrayal. So here's my question, I said to the rabbi. You are a Jewish ruler in Jerusalem, a, a, a non-Jewish military and political ruler comes and says to you, I've got a deal. Have I got a deal for you? I'll make the Jews number one. It's a seven-year deal. Sign here. <laughs> and you know what's in the prophet Daniel. Yeah. Why would they sign? Why would they take the deal? Now, his answer was very surprising. His answer was, oh no, the Jews would take that deal. Now, this is, a, this is an insider's view of Judaism. It's a very learned man. The Jews would take that deal. He said, but you know you're going to get oppressed. You're going to get oppression like never before in three and a half years. Why take the deal? He said, no, the Jews would take that deal because we'll be number one now. Three and a half years is a long time. You don't know what's going to happen. We'll be number one now. We'll take the deal. So his view of, and this is a short termism, that we've spoken to a, a, a contributor called Gilad Atzman, who speaks very well and writes very well on this within Jewish culture. This short termism would mean, even though they knew there could be horrible consequences. We're number one now, and now is all that matters. And they would take the deal. So it's an interesting, I, I, it really surprised me. I didn't know what his answer would be, but it was a very, uh, very surprising answer that gave a lot of indication as to the nature of Jewish culture and Jewish thought. Um, that's, that's, that's present in, in, the, in the general population. To amplify that, Sheikh, I left British intelligence in 2009. Until the day I left, the order regarding Israel was never tell even people with a top secret clearance who don't need to know that we have a partnership with the Israeli agency, Unit 8200. 
if a member of parliament asks, pretends to know nothing. One year later, there was a change of government in Britain. The lines of command between political Zionism and London became closer. And the number two in that government, at least from the Conservative part, Francis Maud, proudly announced that my old agency had a strategic partnership with Unit 8200. What is this but short-termism? They blew one of their best secrets for short-term advantage. It can never be put back in the bottle, that genie, can it? Everyone knows now. Uh, there's always been an obsession, British obsession, with the Holy Land. General Allenby, when he conquered Jerusalem, he said today, the Crusades have ended. Those were his words. Yeah. And the British were the ones who got the League of Nations mandate over the Holy Land and Jerusalem, and the Britain presided over the birth of Israel. So the Balfour Declaration simply confirmed what was there always, a British obsession with the Holy Land. So this news about British intelligence and Israeli intelligence having con contacts with each other is nothing new for us. Yeah.